This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. A series of questions haunted me when I was a young child and a young boy. I mean, literally, these three questions were constantly in my mind. And they were the following. Why was I alive? What is my purpose on planet Earth? And, you know, what am I doing here? They kind of overlap, but I really wanted to know, first of all, why was I alive? What was I doing here on planet Earth? What was my purpose in life? And I remember that these questions obsessed me. But whenever I would ask these questions to my friends or their parents, or most of all to teachers in the school system, I was all, you know, my questions were always uh, kind of just uh, dismissed, ignored. They were given, at best, 5 seconds, 10, 15 seconds worth of attention. And they would move on to something else. Now, I couldn't understand this. To me, this was like, uh, at the earliest of ages, I simply could not understand why learning anything whether it's mathematics or reading or science or whatever, why anything could possibly matter more until we got the answer to the basic questions. Why was I alive? Who am I? And what is my purpose on planet Earth? I mean, to me, that was a no-brainer. If you don't know why you're alive and what your purpose here on planet Earth is and who you really are, all the rest of the stuff is, is, is just a bunch of nonsense. But, you know, uh, other people didn't see it that way. Um, which made me feel somewhat odd. But secretly, I didn't believe I was odd. Secretly, I, I believed I was on the money. But, you know, as a little kid, you got to pretend. you got to get along, get along with the group. you got to fit in, especially in school. And what really bothered me was that in the educational system, which pretended and masqueraded to be a source of education and truth and knowledge, really wasn't. It was a flim-flam organization that... that that, I mean, what does it matter if, if you memorize the birth date of George Washington? What does it matter if you uh, memorize, you know, these historical facts and stuff? They're all important, but they, they become trivial pursuits unless you know the big questions. And none of the teachers I talked to seem to have any idea or clue whatsoever as to why they were alive, what was their purpose in life, and who they were. And none of the, none of the students did. So this, this, this really bothered me, and it continued to boil in my system. And I was raised in an atheistic household, like I told you. I was taught not to believe in God. So, you know, the, the secular school system had no answers. Atheism had no answers except to say we were here by evolutionary accident, and I couldn't really buy that even at the youngest of ages. It had nothing to do with Christianity because I wasn't a Christian. I hated Christians. It just appeared to me to be completely irrational, illogical, and basically you would have to be out of your mind to think you came here by accident. I just couldn't buy into the nonsensical theory of evolution. I thought it was just like, you know, it, it, it didn't sell. I, I just didn't, it didn't, didn't hold true. So I remember going to the University of Missouri and these questions accelerated in my mind. And I became more bold as I became more well-read and as I became better at debating, etc. So I became far more assertive and aggressive in the classroom than I was when I was in elementary school. And I distinctly remember at the University of Missouri raising my hand in the English literature class, and he was talking about, you know, the interpretation of some book by some great author or something. 
And I just, you know, I had, like, had it. So I was very polite, but I, I, ra- I raised my hand. I said, you know, um, can, I, can I ask questions that I think are, like, deeper than the ones we're, we're asking and questions that I think that <clears throat> are more important? You know, this is a very risky thing to say to a professor. And so he allowed me, ironically, to my surprise, he allowed me, my, my English literature professor at the University of Missouri, allowed me to stand before the front of the classroom and, and kind of talk about what I wanted to talk about. And man, I, I'm telling you, I was articulate, I was literate, I was logical, I was rational, but I let it rip. The first time in my life I ever got the opportunity to let it rip. And I let it rip, and I said, you know, how, you know, how many people, remember, I'm not a Christian at this time at all, but I said, how many people in this classroom know why you're alive? Pfft, nobody raised their hand. I said, how many of you know what your purpose in, purpose in life is? Nobody raised their hand. And finally I said, how many of you know um, what you're doing here on planet Earth? And nobody, nobody uh, raised their hand. And then, you know, I, I, I took it from there. I said, how, what on earth are you doing going to an educational system and studying all these courses and assuming you're being educated when you don't know the first thing about your own existence and your purpose in life. Now, I thought the professor was going to shut me down. So I looked over to him, and he was sitting in a chair. And he motioned for me to kind of like, go for it, let it rip. Like, like I'm turning the classroom over to you. You can say anything you want. And I was very surprised. So I let it rip even further. I said, I said, all these questions are the most important questions that we'll ever ask ourselves in, in life, yet all educational institutions can't even begin to answer them. I said, there's something wrong with that. That's not education. You can call it whatever you want to call it, but it's not education. And then I said, what does it matter uh, if you gain all this knowledge in various disciplines and, and fields of study, if you have no clue as to why you're alive, who you are, and what your purpose in life is, it's all meaningless then. It's like, it's like insanity. And my professor liked this kind of talk, which, which surprised me. Many of the students were uncomfortable. Some of them liked it. Most of them were frightened, because this was... This was like, uh, they didn't know what to do with this. See, they, were, they had spent so many years playing the game that's required that you play in the school system, which is you listen carefully for, to the teacher, you memorize the textbook or what the teacher said, you take notes, and then when exam time comes around, you say back to the professor or you repeat from the books, the answers to the question doesn't mean you've learned a, a, you know anything, but that's how the game is played. So none of these students were really educated. They had no idea about their existence or their meaning in life or anything else. So I could tell that they were somewhat uncomfortable with the questions, but I had no intention of le- letting up, and no intention whatsoever. So I looked at the light bulbs, and it was a completely spontaneous thing. I looked at the light bulbs and I said, did you ever ask yourself why, why we have light bulbs? I mean, why is it that there's darkness in the evening and we had to invent light bulbs? I would ask, I mean, maybe that's, they, that may sound like, like almost a trite question, but no, it was like, uh, what I was trying to do is challenge the fundamental assumptions that people had about reality and how they accepted these fundamental assumptions about reality without asking any questions. And the challenge I kept hitting home with was you do not have knowledge, you do not have education if you don't know the answer to these questions. And it got heavier than that. And then the students began to laugh at the, at the humor and the sarcasm I used. So 
to my surprise, at the end of my 45, 50 minute presentation before the classroom, the English professor stood up and gave me a, a, this, he led the class in this thunderous applause, which really surprised me. So he's standing up and applauding me. The students are standing up and applauding me. And, and, and they probably wouldn't have applauded if he had not led the way. And then he said to me publicly before the students, he said, I, he said, you just got up before my classroom and gave the most powerful um, uh, message and challenge and question I have ever heard in all my years in academia. He said, you articulated, he said, extremely well questions that have been haunting me for my entire life. He said, you framed it very well. And, and he thanked me and, 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 you know, really applauded me uh, for doing what I did. Now, what was interesting is at that time, I was still a radical radical politics in the New Age movement, you know, uh, rebellious, certainly not interested in Christianity. But the Lord used my questions to shake up this uh, university professor and to shake up the, cl- uh, the classroom. And, and it, they didn't shake me up because I was, I, was, I was asking these questions for decades to myself. So about a year or two passed by, and um, maybe yeah, about two, 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 two years passed by, and uh, I became a Christian through a miraculous uh, supernatural experience, hitchhiking on the back roads of Missouri, kind of like a field of dreams experience, where I had a supernatural encounter with Jesus Christ that changed my life forever. But even though I was truly born again, I did not learn how to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. So my knowledge of the Word of God was superficial. I didn't have a group of believers that I was regularly regularly meeting with to, to support me. And so in time, I backslid. Uh, because the roots weren't very deep in my born-again experience. But the minute I backslid, the Lord began to chastise me. The Lord began to deal with me. In other words, the Lord did not allow me to have any peace or satisfaction in my back backsliding. And he sent people to me, and he arranged circumstances to chastise me, and to bring me back to himself. And one of the things he used was this. I'm walking on the campus of the university, and I bumped I bump into this college professor, the one who let me kind of take over his classroom and, and give that speech I just referred to. And uh, I look at him, and his face is glowing. And, and all of a sudden, he begins to tell me that... that uh, uh, he has become a Christian and that he accepted Jesus Christ into his life and was born again. And then he thanked me because he said, um, I don't know whether you know it or not, but the, the message and the questions you gave in my classroom, he said, were, were, were key in bringing me to Christ because the questions that you asked really shook me up and uh, caused me to search for the truth, which I found in Jesus Christ. And I have accepted Christ into my life, and I'm now born again. And man, you know, that hit me like a ton, ton of bricks. I, I didn't tell him that I was backslidden. I didn't tell him that I g- got saved since the time of his classroom, and that I walked away from the Lord. But there I am, talking to this college professor, who is a living testimony to the reality of Jesus Christ. And this college professor is thanking me for asking these tough questions about reality and the meaning of life and how it impacted him and and caused him to, to accept Christ as his Lord and Savior. 
I mean, believe me, that convicted me big time. So the Lord used, I didn't give a Christian message because there wasn't a Christian in his classroom. I just gave a truthful message. And the Lord used my bumping into him. Mm -hmm. The Lord used it to convict me. So shortly after, I, I, I repented to the Lord and I, I returned to the Lord. And I've been walking with the Lord, you know, ever since. But my point is that the university, college, high school, elementary school systems are all designed to keep the truth from you, especially the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord, the God of the Bible is real, and that's the God of the Bible who created mankind. Those are, those are like guarded uh, there's there's guards at the gate that do not allow students to hear articulate messages about the truth in Jesus Christ. And they use an entire array of methods to erect mental blockades that will prevent students from hearing the truth. First and foremost, they'll use peer pressure. They'll always make sure there's a large percentage of students that will mock at you and laugh at you if you dare to say that you believe in the creation account in Genesis. There will always be a large number of students who will laugh and mock at you if you say you believe in the God of the Bible. So the peer pressure is enormous. So a lot of kids who are saved, a lot of kids who come from Christian homes, when they go to a big secular university, uh, they, they lay low because they don't want to be a target of ridicule. So that's one technique. Another technique is in none of the textbooks will you ever read um, a paragraph, a description, a chapter which portrays Christianity or Judaism accurately or presents the biblical truths accurately. It will be always be some kind of distorted attack on the Bible or the biblical God. And then finally the professors themselves are almost a hundred percent of the time uh, atheists or agnostics and their bias, I mean they, they rule and reign their classrooms and lecture halls like kings and queens and their bias uh, and their particular belief system, which is always atheistic, it's always liberal, and it's always anti-biblical. I mean, you better dance to the tune of that music or you're, you, you will fail in college. I mean, up until this day, as somebody who's a Bible teacher and a speaker, uh, whose messages are heard all over the United States and worldwide, I constantly talk to people or run into people constantly who always tell me the same thing, which is um, that in order to get a good grade, in order to be accepted at a good college or whatever, you have to repeat word for word whatever the professor tells you to believe. If you get a test or you're giving a verbal reply, you must repeat what the professor says and agree with whatever his philosophical position is word for word. And when it comes to a test or an essay, you must repeat the belief system that the professor um, taught you to believe, which is always atheism, humanism, socialism, uh, evolutionary theory, etc. And if you dare, if you dare to, to no matter how well re researched your paperwork is, no matter how eloquent your argument is, if you dare to depart from the liberal, humanistic, socialistic, atheistic viewpoint, you will be severely penalized. You will either get a failing grade or an F or a D minus or something, or you won't pass the classroom, and it will never be done in a fair and square manner. It will always be done 
you will be judged and evaluated not on the basis of academic criteria like how well researched was your argument you know what were your sources you will only be judged by your your end product your content so if you say you're a christian you will fail because that's not acceptable and that's how the whole mind control process works and you put kids through you know 10 or more years of public education and then just the barrage of the mass media or whatever and you've programmed them to believe what you want them to believe and that's what that is what is evident all around us we have numerous generations of young people and adults who have been programmed to believe a particular set of beliefs for the various factors due to the various factors that I've outlined and again peer pressure which we haven't brought up until today peer pressure is an essential ingredient in the process you'll notice that despite all the bravado of Americans they unless they have the right brand name on their running shoes and their clothing or have the right car manufacturer or whatever it is Americans feel totally insecure because their identities are hollow you see they don't get their identity from uh, the fact that they were created in the image of God and as people created in the image of God they inherently have value and self-worth no that's a non equation for them what they do is they have to have the right kind of car the right kind of shirt the right kind of running shoes brand names and labeling are are the key because basically in America and Europe we have hollow men and hollow women who who are empty who are not secure about their identity apart from how much money they spend to buy something that they believe will magically impart unto them an identity of strength and power and superiority you know like Nike just do it or whatever that's how it works now for those people who were truly born again christians whose minds are renewed by the word of god it doesn't mean that they can't dress fashionably or in style or whatever but their entire identity is not hanging in the balance over what what brand name car or brand name jeans or running shoes or whatever they're wearing or the the brand of computer or cell phone that they have that their identity is not all wrapped up around a product and a branding and that's why advertising is so powerful in our nation because people are again they're empty they're hollow and it's easy to manipulate them all you have to do to the average person is show in a news story or show in a commercial that these images of celebrities or powerful people they admire or images and pictures of people who look like they have power and attractiveness and intelligence and all these uh identity factors that people want to have if people have the right look or they're wearing the right watch or whatever then people are programmed to automatically believe that the way they can uh be perceived as being powerful successful attractive sexually attractive intelligent or whatever is through the purchasing of certain brand names and the better the brand name you purpose you purchase uh the more uh a person thinks that their identity is secure which means they're always insecure because there's always a new product a new brand a new service that comes out that displaces the other one and that's how our media saturated society works but what is that all of this is advertising 
social engineering, propaganda, mind control. It's how you manipulate people. You manipulate their behavior. You cause them to buy products, brand names, uh, services, etc., based on manipulating their identity. For example, if you look at any car commercial, in the first 15 to 20 seconds, you will see, <clears throat> if you observe carefully in the automobile commercial, who they're targeting as the consumer. In other words, the commercial you're watching is, is, is specifically created to reach a particular kind of person. And that person is usually seen very quickly um, sitting in the driver's seat of the car driving. Now, before the target buyer is seen sitting in the, in the driver's seat and driving, there may be a celebrity sitting in that same driver's seat and driving, a celebrity that the target buyer would look up to or a model or an actor or something that looks like uh, an idealized version of what what the car buyer would like to see themselves as. And so the message is, is sent um, into the potential buyer and the message goes something like this. If you buy this car, you will look like, you know, you're upper class, you have it made, that you're successful, that you have power, that you're a liberated woman, that you're a macho man or whatever. And that's what people are buying. That's why when you look at the truck commercials, you know, like for the F-250s and all the other uh, uh, trucks, I'm not talking about gigantic trucks, but I'm talking about <clears throat> trucks that, you know, you can see two people, or if it has a cab, more people. Well, those trucks uh, are are sold to put to uh, a male, a uh, particular type of male, and what that male is buying is power and prestige. That's why he wants that truck, because it it confers upon him the masculinity, the power and prestige he wants. And then you have different kinds of cars that can be a little bit high-end, but they're more elegant, and they're targeted to particular kinds of women who want to enhance their social status. And the same with men. And you know how the game works. But it's all mind control. It's all brainwashing. And what makes it work is that people are hollow inside. So by showing them images and symbols and actors and characters, you control, you, not only do you control their buying habits, you control their identity, which is the core of their being. That's why when I was going back to the classroom and I, I said the questions that I think are the most important to answer are things like, what am I doing here on planet Earth? What is my purpose in life? Who, who, who am I? Well, what, what, what do those questions all involve? They all involve answering the question about your identity. Okay? And if you really know that you're a child of God, if you really know that you're a joint heir with Jesus, and you really know what the Word of God says regarding your identity, I'm not talking about a religious perception, but if you really have a revelation from God about who you are in Christ, then your identity is turned on, your identity is activated, and you're not dependent upon some product or service or car or clothing or, or brand name to, to make you feel in a counterfeit sense, like you have an identity. And so the first step towards personal freedom is learning how to transcend the religious world and learning how to get a revelation from God about who your real identity is and then begin to walk in it. Because when you understand your identity, in Christ, 
you automatically recognize that you're a person of power, you're a person of worth, you're a person of destiny, you're a person of intelligence, you're a person of victory, you're a person of beauty, you're a person of uh, who has a chosen, who's been chosen by God, and you're a per, you're a person that that has a purpose in life. These are things that are so far beyond the consciousness of the average man or woman in America and around the world. They have you know all they are is pawns on a chessboard. You're not a pawn on a chessboard. You've escaped this matrix-like world of mind control conditioning. And that's the goal, see? That's what it really means by renewing your mind um, in the Word or having the mind of Christ. That's what it really means, not some superficial understanding. You see, we uh, have all been born into the world system. The world system is Mystery Babylon. It's a Babylonian system that is ruled by Lucifer, who's the temporary god of this world. And it's all about this hierarchical structure, the pyramid structure. And the higher you are in the occult, pyramidical, hierarchical, organizational structure of Lucifer, like the pyramid depicted on the back of the U.S. dollar, the more powerful you're supposed to be. Okay? with the all-seeing eye of Lucifer towards the top. But that's that right there, that's the center of the, the power of the matrix. The matrix is a spiritual, technological, vibrational, sensory, energy source, and artificial reality that's constructed through the power of Lucifer, in order to control reality, control people's minds, and exercise the counterfeit dominion of Lucifer on this planet and on this world, based entirely on lies, because Satan is a liar. And Satan rules the world by lies. And to the degree that you have been seduced by those lies is to the degree that you are in captivity. Now, if you choose to come to the place in your life where you transcend the lies and transcend the captivity, then you discover the awesome power of your real identity, the awesome power of and powers that are available to you in Christ that enable you to transcend this world system. You escape the matrix, so to speak. And so, when I do a program like this, there's many of you out there that know exactly what I'm talking about. You have escaped the matrix. But there's many of you out there who are are attracted to the program because you want to learn how to escape the matrix. And if that's your desire, if your desire is to learn how to escape the matrix, you will. If you listen to this program and study it, the principles, and grasp the principles, you will come to the place in your life where the power of God's truth will accumulate in your life and you will transcend the prison of the matrix. And then you'll have this realization of just how much power and purpose and identity God has placed in your life. And you will not be a slave in some kind of scientific dictatorship like um, uh, Aldous Huxley described. You won't be a slave in a scientific dictatorship you will be more than an overcomer in Christ Jesus. You will be the possessor of supernatural powers that will enable you to overturn and overrule the mind control powers that program you to be a slave or to enjoy your slavery. You will walk free. I mean, that's mind-blowing. I don't know what, what more you can ask for. That's mind-blowing. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. We'll be back in a moment. 
visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. Um, one of the things that God wants his people to know is first that you are created in the image of God. And as such, you have the DNA of God existing inside of you. But also, because you were created in the image of God, you're, and, and assuming you're saved and have accepted Christ into your life, you have been given supernatural powers, supernatural gifts, spiritual gifts, and natural gifts and talents. And it is one of the highest objectives of God to renew your mind so that you can live your life and operate on the higher level of victory that God created you to live in. But the price tag for possessing that promised land, so to speak, is you must actively engage it. In other words, unless you're willing to really renew your mind, you're not going to gain access to it. You have to be willing to pay the price. Now, by pay the price, I mean, I'm not talking about doing religious good works. I'm saying the Lord tells us how we can be transformed, how we can become overcomers, what our identity is. So, so that's really what it means when it means to become a disciple of Christ, a follower of Christ. So if you're willing to undertake that spiritual journey, the reward down here on earth is incredible, but the reward eternally is phenomenal and mind-blowing. And it has everything to do with faith, believing God's Word, but you can't believe God's Word unless you study God's Word. And you can't learn how to think in a modality that will give you victory unless you renew your mind with the Word of God. This is the, this is, this is the battle, once again, We are in the greatest battle in the history of the world and the history of mankind over the hearts and minds of mankind, the thoughts, the ideas, the inner beliefs in the hearts of mankind. We are in the greatest spiritual battle regarding those things than ever has been in the history of time. And that is because we're getting close prophetically to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to earth when there will be this final battle at Armageddon, when the Lord Jesus Christ will descend from heaven with the armies of heaven and he will defeat the Antichrist, the false prophet, Satan, all those who accepted the mark of the beast and all those who are followers of the Antichrist and Lucifer. They will be defeated at Armageddon and Jesus Christ will rule and reign planet Earth from the new capital of Earth, which is Jerusalem, and a thousand-year millennial reign with Jesus Christ will begin. And then the second and then along with the second coming, there will be the, the establishment of the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. Where all the things that I just talked about will be fully manifest in your life as you receive your glorified body and so on and so forth. Now, right now we are in this great spiritual battle and and the battle is a mind battle. It's a mind control battle because the forces of Lucifer, their primary technique is to use Really, ancient sorcery, ancient magic, uh, ancient magical powers, sorcery, going way back to Mystery Babylon. And they just renamed it with scientific terms and they added scientific technology to it 
in order to control mankind. But it's at its root, it's it's Babylon. It's the return and the rise of Babylon again. So how do you allow yourself to be transformed and your children and grandchildren and your society? Okay, this is this is this is where wisdom is so important. This is where the wisdom of God is essential. You don't win a spiritual battle for the hearts and minds of mankind by using carnal or fleshly weapons. So yes, it's important to be politically involved. Yes, it's important to vote. Yes, it's important to stand up for key issues and righteousness. Absolutely. Because we live in both a natural, physical world as well as a spiritual world. We are responsible for both. Not just one, but both worlds. But in addition to that, we are to use the weapons of our warfare that are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Our greatest supernatural strengths come from the power of the Lord. And to the degree the church relies on and has faith in the power of the Lord, it's to that degree that the church can operate supernaturally and in victory. And that is what will dismantle the the programming and mind control embedded in the hearts and minds of millions of people. Intellectual debates won't do it. They will do it to some degree for some people. But if we're talking about delivering millions and millions of people from the lies of the evil one, We must call upon the power of God and see supernatural deliverance. Supernatural deliverance. So, how do we do this? How do we we turn on the big power switch? Well, we turn on the big power switch by coming to the place where we recognize, just like we did regarding salvation, we have to come to the place where we recognize that we could not be saved by any effort or strength uh, based on our own willpower or fleshly effort. It is impossible for any of us to have been saved through our own energy or strength. The only way we could be saved was to put our faith in the supernatural power of God and His Word, ask Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins by faith, and then invite Jesus Christ to come into our lives and make us born again. And then by our dependence upon Christ by faith, Jesus Christ would save us. He would live inside of us through the Spirit of God. He would save our souls and we would be born again. And then in the day-to-day lives of believers, we are victorious over sin and Satan and the devil, not by our fleshly willpower or best efforts, determination to fight temptation. But we are victorious based on the faith we put in the power of God, the trust and faith we put in the power of God. And to the degree we put our faith in the power of God, that is to the degree that it is released. So in the same way, we... Obviously, just like the children of Israel were were commanded by God to enter the promised land, just like Joshua and Caleb were promised by God to enter the promised land, we as believers are commanded by God to enter the promised land. So in order for us to possess and become everything that we were created to be by God, we need to enter the throne room of God by faith, cleansed in the blood of Jesus Christ, and call upon God to send His Holy Spirit to fill us, to to transform us, to study His Word, and allow His Word to renew us, and to call out to God and not let go until we see God's supernatural power completely transform us and make us into more than conquerors in Christ Jesus as he destined us to become. So right now with this great spiritual battle going on 
for America and around the world, what is the most strategic thing that you and I can do? Well, the most strategic thing that you and I can do is to cry out to God in His power, to pray to God, to ask God to fill us with the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit, to ask Him to renew our minds, to ask Him to fill us to overflowing with the power of God, to ask Him to give us victory and to enable us to overcome and to transform us in our inner man or woman. Because you see, once Christ was invited into our lives, we became new creatures in Christ Jesus. That means old things passed away and all things became new. So our identity has been transformed. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? The old man and the old woman was crucified with Christ on the cross And we are to adopt the identity. We are to fully adopt and embrace the identity of our being new creatures in Christ Jesus, or new men or new women in Christ Jesus. To the degree we adopt that new identity by faith, we then become more than conquerors in Christ Jesus, and we then become overcomers in Christ Jesus. We are no longer mortal men and women. We are supernatural men and women. And at that moment that we, by faith, apprehend that and ask for that and walk in it, at that moment, by faith, we move from mortal to immortal and the supernatural power of God begins to permeate and infuse our core identity And we become people of God who walk under the supernatural authority, the power of God, and the mind of Christ. And we no longer live our lives as victims. We no longer live our lives as prisoners. We are now in practicality in the everyday areas of real life. We are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. And now we have the supernatural power, each one of us, we now possess the supernatural power to turn the tide of the spiritual battlefield. So that means our minds have been reframed. Our perception has been recalculated by the Spirit of God. So when we survey the reality all around us. We no longer see the reality through the Babylonian mind control system. We don't see reality and we don't see ourselves as we are prisoners, we're defeated, we're slaves, we're powerless, we're being conquered, uh, we're impotent, there's nothing we can do. No, that's all a lie. That's all a lie that was projected upon us by the evil one. When we have our minds renewed, we reject the lie, we embrace the truth, and we escape the matrix because the matrix is based on lies. I explain this entire dynamic in my book, Conquering the Matrix, which you need to get and read, along with Mass Awakening. You escape the matrix... And now you see life the way God wants you to see life. And you understand that you're no longer a slave. You're a conqueror. So whatever problem God calls you to address, whether it's on the interpersonal level or a larger level, you now have a supernatural anointing by God to address that problem and solve that problem. You're not who you used to be. You're not the weak, um, inept, faltering person you used to be. And, and, And you say, well, how do I get from where I am to where I'm supposed to be? Faith. Stop believing in who you are based on the lie you have been told. Stop believing the lie about yourself self and start believing the truth about yourself the minute you habitually begin to do that you become 
the true image of yourself that Christ created you to be. And you become a game changer. You become powerful spiritually. You become one of the people that God calls a mighty man of God or a mighty woman of God. You know, in the Old Testament, there were references to mighty men of God. Now, there were the giants of old, and sometimes there was some confusion regarding these titles, especially when people would mix up the giants of old, the Nephilim, with the true mighty men of God, which were warriors of God, like the people, like King David and those that, that followed King David. But do you think for a moment that the mighty men of God um, disappeared and, and they still are not with us? No, no. The mighty men of God, and that should also include the mighty women of God, are alive and still with us. The question is, in your identity, I mean, I wouldn't go around telling people this publicly, you're going to open the door for ridicule and stuff, but, but do you think God stopped producing mighty men and mighty women of God in the Old Testament? No. There are mighty men and mighty women of God all among us, all over planet Earth. It's just they walk with wisdom and they don't go around announcing it to everybody. And God has called you to be a mighty man of God or a mighty woman of God. Not for the purpose of ego gratification, but for the purpose of God is affirming the power, the glory, the majesty, the wisdom, the heavenly craftsmanship that he worked in you that allows you to be more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. You see, The body of Christ, when it is functioning properly, has the power to change the direction of reality. It's just that simple. And again, that does not mean changing Bible prophecy or changing God's sovereign word. Now, this is such a rich and important and deep truth. And this truth will set God's people free. But in order for this truth to set God's people free, they have to hear this truth. And our ministry is dedicated to communicating this truth to people so that they'll hear it and they will become what God is calling them to become. And thus we win the spiritual battlefield. But the key is to multiply and spread the message far and wide as fast as possible. And that's where you and I need to join together as one. In one purpose, thought, deed, and action, we function as one in Christ. And in partnership, we come into agreement to spread this word far and wide, to to bring it into the hearts and minds of people all across the United States and the world by using every single media tool available conferences and messages and books, etc., the full spectrum of media, we use all of it to spread the me- this message to millions and millions of people. As we do, a significant percentage of those millions and millions of people, their lives will be radically transformed, and as a byproduct, the, 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 the tide of the battle the spiritual battle, the tide of the spiritual battle will be changed before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ so that we can have a last day's soul harvest and God can fulfill his supernatural plan for America and his supernatural plan for your nation. So I'm asking you to join with me in partnership. I'm asking all of you, those of you that pray with me, as intercessory prayer warriors, those of you that um, help spread the message far and wide, those of you that seek the Lord and give generously to support this ministry with your financial contributions and gifts, together we will change the land. In fact, together we are changing the land. Think of the internet as like one giant brain, like one living consciousness. You know, 
by the grace of God through this ministry, because we've pumped out so many articles, so many YouTubes, so many messages that have gone viral. It's in the millions and the millions and the millions. We have changed to, to whatever degree the consciousness of the Internet, the thinking, the perceptions of the, the, the hundreds of millions of people that are into the Internet. We've changed it. Now, am I saying we've totally transformed it? No. But I believe that we have functioned as salt and light to, to a kind of global consciousness. And Jesus Christ said that if the salt and light is functioning properly, if the salt has not lost its savor, etc., we are a transforming agent for Jesus on a global and national level. I believe that we've done that. And I believe that if you were to take what we have done and what other key ministries have done out of the consciousness of the Internet, if you think that the Internet is a, is a difficult place now, it would be just cold and devoid of any truth. We've pumped a lot of truth out there. And it's been and it's caught on virally because we've encouraged people to virally spread the messages and the articles that I've written. And there are millions and millions of pages of those articles which contain truths about Jesus Christ and they're written in ways that capture the imagination of, of more contemporary generations. That's a success. And the reason it's a, it's a success, because all of that is not due to one man, myself. It's due to us as being partners and functioning as one. So I, I want to thank every one of you that have functioned as obedient intercessory prayer warriors, praying for me, the ministry, my family. I want to thank you, those of you that have helped us do the end run with technology. I want to thank those of you that uh, seek the face of the Lord and whatever he speaks to you in terms of about your contributions or donations, you obey him. Because of all of your obedience and because of our willingness to join together as one, we have helped bring in the last day's soul harvest, and we've just begun. So I want to encourage you to continue to partner with us, and you can do that by going to paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. By the way, you can go to our Roku channel called Paul McGuire Ministries. We have 100 hours of broadcast quality television programming up there now. Many of our Paradise Mountain, uh, many of my prophecy messages and Bible teachings are up there on the Roku channel and, and broadcast quality, and you can spread them to your friends. You can go to paulmcguire.us and use the social media icons and send these articles and radio messages to people all over the world. And that's how we spread the message. So I want to thank you for your part in making this happen. I also want to alert you to the to the fact that we have two Paradise Mountain Church meetings coming up very soon, and we will have an entire series coming up after that. And we will be meeting regularly. Um, and for those of you that can't, well, you should come physically if you possibly can. I explained that yesterday. But if you can't possibly come um, uh, physically, you can join us because we'll have these messages recorded in broadcast quality television for you to watch on the Roku channel, uh, which is Paul McGuire Ministries. So, coming up at the Sportsman's Lodge in North Hollywood, Thursday, August 23rd, beginning at 7 p.m., uh, we have a powerful conference coming up. Not conference, a message a uh, prophetic message that God has given me that I'll go into later. I started on yesterday's program. And then coming up um, the, the following month, Thursday, September 20th, also at the Sportsman's Lodge, starting at 7 p.m., 
we have another Paradise Mountain Church meeting, and I'll have a, a prophetic message that God's given me. And then we have meetings uh, in October, November, December, and uh, after that. Now, you need, the meetings are free, but you need to register. You can get instructions, map, uh, the whole thing. Parking is free. If you choose not to park in the paid parking lot, you can par- park across the street uh, where it's free. And you need to join us because the power of the Lord uh, is going to move and God has a message for us and God is going to move mightily in the midst of his people. And I believe many of you who come, who make the sacrifice to come, are going to be set free. You're going to be given fresh vision from the Lord. And you'll experience the Lord transforming your life in a, I believe, in an unprecedented way. But you need to show up and be there. And uh, as we worship God together and enter into the presence of the Lord together. So, I gave you the dates. You can get the map, the details, all the specifics by going to paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. By the way, Friday, I'll be on the Hagman Report uh, coming up Friday for two hours. You can find all about that at paulmcguire.us. And man, there's a lot of stuff happening. So visit paulmcguire.us to, to stay in touch and know uh, know what's going on. Stay connected to us. This is the Paul McGuire Report. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. And we'll be back in just a moment. This is Paul McGuire. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. There are so many things going on um, through this ministry, in this ministry. Some of the things I can say publicly, some of the things I can't. But I, I want to just share with you the fact that <clears throat> for every one of you who have chosen to partner with us, we are bearing real and measurable fruit. We're not just entertaining believers. We're transforming our world and nation and without going into the details we're transforming our world and nation at some of the highest highest places of power in this world and, and I can't I can't go into it any uh, in detail any more than that um, perhaps sometime I will but I can't do it now uh, the books that we write, are, are are entering arenas and, and levels of power that I never I never dreamed of. And they're acting as salt and light, they're influencing and they're transforming. The Babylon Code, for example, that I wrote with Troy Anderson, uh, is like the number two prophecy book in the world right now and that's after being out for like two years Trumpocalypse which just came out in January is the number one selling prophecy book in the world and Trumpocalypse is reaching <laughs> into the highest halls and level levels of power in the United States and around the world and that's all really I can say at this moment and that's because we have partners like you that are behind us. We have the Paradise Mountain Church meetings where we're meeting physically, but we're also uh, recording them in broadcast television quality so you can watch it anywhere in the world on the Roku channel. We have a feature film in the process of being made with with. Hollywood producers uh, based on Trumpocalypse and the Babylon Code is also in development as a feature film. We have the expansion of our television ministry going now, going on now, which means we're expanding that and we're reaching into more homes and households. But at the same time, as most of you know, 
there's an all-out war on conservative voices, on Christian voices, on voices that speak about Bible prophecy. And so we have planned for this and have developed and are on alternative methods of delivery so that we won't be, you know, we won't disappear because they're trying to, they're making a lot of people disappear. But we won't disappear because we have, we're not relying on just um, a couple of powerful social media giants, which obviously don't like Christians very much. And uh, I'll leave that alone for now. But we're being proactive. And the message that we're communicating is spreading. It's spreading because there is tremendous hunger out there. And that hunger among Christians and non-Christians is growing every day. You see, uh, when I first started out communicating the kind of messages that I did and do, I mean, it was like communicating to cement. I'm serious. The hardness of heart, the resistance, the anger, the the accusations from Christians. I'm talking about from born-again, spirit-filled Christians. Uh, was enormous. But because the external society has changed so radically, because there's so much social disintegration, because chaos is being amped up, and because anybody with half a brain can see that a lot of this chaos is being engineered and and there's manufactured news and there's uh, an unprecedented social media attack uh, against people who believe in uh, biblical principles. This has this has caused people to be shaken, and now they're no longer resistant to our message. They're hungry for our message because a paradigm shift has occurred. They, are, they used to be uh, satisfied with, with the hollow, empty kind of plastic uh, cliches uh, that passed off as Bible teaching. But people are tired of that. I mean, they're more than tired of it. They're rejecting it like crazy. Now they want something stronger. They want something potent. They want the truth. And before, they weren't willing to hear anything that was too intense. Now they're starving for it because more and more people are trying to make sense about what's happening. Because what's happening is something that they were not prepared for by their church or their pastor or their denomination. So they're out there in the wilderness grasping for answers, and we have been committed and faithful in giving those answers for like 40 years. So now there's a, there's a change in the tide. There's a hunger, uh, both in the U.S. and the world, for the, the harder, more powerful teachings of Bible prophecy, of analysis. I mean, when I first began writing prophecy books, and I began using words like the Illuminati, and I began talking about the North American Union and the Bilderberg Group. People thought I was like from from Mars. Yeah, Christians. They thought I was from like Mars. I would get attacked. I don't mind getting attacked. I really don't. I've been attacked my whole life. But the, the attacks would be irrational. They would just like foam at the mouth like rabid dogs. And this was in seminaries and, and Christian meetings with sp- so-called spirit-filled leaders. And that, that's how they would, not all of them, many of them were polite and listened, even if it was a stretch. But, you know, it's like, I don't mind being attacked, but they had no, they had no uh, uh, logical argument. They did no research. It was just emotionalism. They were in denial. But guess what? There has been a fundamental change out there in the last four years or maybe five years. And it's intensifying. Now, when I talk about the Illuminati, everybody knows what I'm talking about. 
And if the Christian pastors and, and certain people don't, their kids all know. They're the high school kids, the junior high, they all know about the Illuminati. Skull and bones. I used to bring up skull and bones and people would, would turn white as a ghost. Well now, skull and bones is a known entity. It's no longer considered this fringe conspiracy theory. Well, I was talking about that for, you know, 30 years ago. And on and on it goes. You know, Nephilim, dear God, if you brought up the Nephilim 10, uh, 15 years ago, forget about it. You were dead meat. But now there's some very excellent Bible teachers, many of them friends of mine, who write books on the Nephilim and stuff like that. And so people, because society has changed, because it's so obvious that we have entered into the realm of the last days, the hunger for truth has intensified. And and so when you're in the business, I don't like to use the word business, when you're in the ministry of evangelism and reaching people's hearts and minds and souls and winning them to Christ, I find it, well, it's still a challenge, but I find it much easier on, in many respects than it used to be. Because what used to happen, you would just be barraged with hatred and accusations of being a lunatic because you said Illuminati. In fact, just I, let's just go back like, uh, what is it, two years? About two years or so? Troy Anderson and I finished writing The Babylon Code which dealt with the Illuminati and secret societies and stuff like that. It's an excellent book. You ought to read it. And when we began shopping it around, we got, we got, you know, we, we, we were approaching big publishers. The publisher that picked it up is the third largest publisher in the world. And I'm not talking about the publisher that picked it up, but we were talking to other publishers I, and they weren't trying to be rude or anything, but, but, but the people on their editorial board would ask us challenging questions. In their mind, they were challenging questions like, you know, you're talking about the Illuminati as if it, it's the real group. Um, and then this uh, high-level editor said, well, but as I understand it, the, the Illuminati ceased to exist, uh, you know, like, 200 years ago. Therefore, you know, I have a problem with your book, you know, being true because the Illuminati uh, ceased to function, you know, 200 years ago. Well, the problem with, so, so, so you know, we, we, this was two, two and a half years ago or something. So when we were shopping around the Babylon Code, we met with resistance. Well, we answered this uh, gentleman's uh, critique and question politely, but we politely pointed out to him through historical facts and documentation that the Illuminati has never ceased to exist, and he needs to recheck some of his uh, research material because there's no, there's no evidence whatsoever to su- suggest that the Illuminati went out of business. It's, it's in business now. And for whatever reason, he was satisfied with our answer. But we, what I'm trying to say is we met some resistance. Well, no, we met resistance um, when we were selling the book to publishers, The Babylon Code. But I believe that, 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 that the success of The Babylon Code, which has been enormous, is due to God's grace and to timing. If we, I believe if we had published the Babylon, uh, Babylon Code a year earlier than when, when we did, people, the mass public, and especially Christians, would not have been ready for it. So it was God's grace that, because I've been talking about this stuff for 40 years, but it's God's grace that we came out with the Babylon Code, which dealt with secret societies like the Illuminati, etc., And by God's grace, it came out at just the right time so that people, the Christian public, was hungry for this kind of truth. They wanted somebody to connect the dots for them. And so the book exploded. It took off. Then with Trumpocalypse that I wrote with Troy Anderson, we also 
uh, we ventured into the territory that that really nobody else had ever ventured into. Um, um, we took prophecy. We uh, analyzed current events and political events through the lens of prophecy. And we touched subjects that nobody touched, especially in the prophecy genre. I mean, we connected in the Trumpocalypse, um, you know, the occult beliefs of Christine Lagarde of the International Monetary Fund and all kinds of things. All kinds of things. The deep state. <laughs> I mean, we, when we wrote Trumpocalypse... We, when you read Trumpocalypse, it's like reading something that was written yesterday. We talked about the deep state. We talked about the shadow government. We talked about the various psychological warfare against Trump. We talked about skull and bones and, and all kinds of stuff, and the globalists and the globalist elite. But we wrote about all this before all those terms, like, for example, the deep state, deep state was not even a term that was used when we were writing Trumpocalypse. And many of the other words that we used all over the book Trumpocalypse were not used in the media or anywhere. And yet, yet when we came out with Trumpocalypse, Suddenly we hit an environment where these words were front and center all over the, 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 the alternative media and the mainstream media. Of course, the, the mainstream media is still in denial of so much reality, it's ridiculous, but we used words that were never used before, that people would never have dared to discuss, and we put it in the book. Now that's the grace of God. In both cases, the timing was the grace of God. There was no way we could have planned to release books that, if they were released any sooner than they were, they would have been met with total uh, censorship and hostility. They hit at the time when people when so, the pe- people didn't even know what the deep state was when we wrote, most people, when we wrote Trumpocalypse. But we... T- talked about the history, the deep, the, the the media is still trying to figure out what, who the deep state is. We, we 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 outline who the deep state is, where they came from, who they are. So, that is the gift of God, and what that does is when you're on the cutting edge of presenting the truth, your books, your videos, your messages, um. Pull in anybody who's hungry for truth, anywhere in the U.S. and the world, anybody who's hungry for truth ends up gravitating to, uh, you know, the website, the video messages, the books, because the, they're, they're giving you cutting-edge truth. And so we're called to be fishers of men. And the reason we are highly successful in this ministry is highly successful in winning souls and evangelism, in bringing backsliders back to Christ and transforming lives, the reason it's highly successful is because it, we talk about the relevant issues, the red hot, relevant, cutting edge issues. You know, we're not talking about it like we wrote the book 30 years ago. Now, I didn't say all that to brag, I said all that to, to encourage those of you who are our partners, that we mean business when we say we, we want to do everything in our power to, uh, to teach God's people to occupy the land until he comes. We want to do everything in, in God's power to uh, bring in the last day's soul harvest, to win souls, to make disciples of all nations, to do kingdom business until he comes. See, we're serious about it. And most of you listening are serious about it, and that's why we're one. So visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. Remember, we have two Paradise Mountain Church meetings coming up. The map and everything is at paulmcguire.us. My message will be called The Vision, God's Supernatural Plan for America in the Last Days. It's a powerful prophetic message, and you need to be at the meeting because... Not only will we 
study and teach the word, but the supernatural power of God will move on that meeting. Why? Because we cry out, we pray, we intercede before every meeting. And so when you come, expect to be ministered by God's word and expect to be ministered to by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then as always, at every Paradise Mountain Church meeting, anybody who desires personal prayer, I make myself available uh, to pray for each and every one who, who wants to be prayed for. God bless you. I'm Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. <laughs>